Welcome to the official podcast of DogsDaily.com, a Sports Illustrated channel. Gets to the edge. Tony Michelle will send the Dogs home to the championship game. If you're looking for the latest Georgia Bulldog news in football, basketball, baseball, and recruiting, then you're in the right place. Hosted by Dogs Daily Riders, Jeremiah Stoddard, Kyle Funderburg, and Jonathan Williams. Here's a pitch. And high out in the right center with some carry. It's got a chance. This ball is out of here. Tucker Bradley has won it. Just sit back, relax, and prepare yourself for these hot takes you're about to listen to. to another episode of, of Classic City Sports. As always, Jeremiah Stoddard and Jonathan Williams here for you today. Uh, not a ton of stuff from the game itself other than, you know, little things you can look at from Georgia's game last weekend against UAB. So uh, we're going to cover, you know, key players that we saw, some standout performances, things like that, some conversations over quarterback situation at the University of Georgia, all that. There's a couple of... Um, things that were put out by ESPN that we're going to kind of talk about as well, because they kind of made us um, think a little bit uh, and question some things that they're putting out there. So we're going to go over all that kind of stuff and then look forward to that game against South Carolina next weekend. It is Wednesday, the uh, 15th, September 15th, about 7, 12 right now. So getting this out to you, hopefully it's all available first thing tomorrow morning or not tomorrow morning, maybe, but first thing, you know, tomorrow afternoon, uh, the video will be available. Podcast should be up early in the morning. Typically, I can have that out pretty early. So if you're listening to us on Thursday, we appreciate it. Uh, hopefully, you stick around for the whole episode with us. We'll try to keep it a little short, sweet to the point today, though. So first thing I'll do is I'll kick it over to Jonathan real quick and get your initial reactions from the game itself, not like the speculation around the game, but just the game itself against UAB on Saturday. Well, the big question that was kind of surrounding this game was everybody wanted to see Georgia become explosive offensively because you didn't really get a look at that against Clemson, didn't really have the opportunity to. So that was the big question going into this game. And boy, did they deliver. They delivered on the second play of the game when Stetson hit Jermaine Burton for a 73-yard touchdown pass. And it was just play after play after play after play for the offense. So offense opened up, and that was with Stetson Bennett under center. So who knows what it'll look like now with JT Daniels. That's probably the next question that everybody's focusing on is we want to see JT under center now with this offense. And it'll develop even more when we get more pieces back at wide receivers, still missing some key pieces there. So that was my big reaction was finally got to see the offense just click and they looked really solid throughout the whole game. Absolutely. And talking about being explosive, we were looking at the stats a little bit before the game and uh, Stetson Bennett in his first five pass attempts, So just a minute into the second quarter is when he got that last touchdown that adds to the stat, five for five. So he went five for five, four touchdowns, and 245 yards in five plays. I mean, if you want explosive offense, I think that's it right there. I mean, yeah, that's the definition of it. Absolutely. And all the speculation ahead of the game that there was out there about, you know, who was going to be the starting quarterback for Georgia on Saturday because it came out, you know, publicly – I think it was around Thursday that it was like public out everywhere that, uh, you know, JT Daniels was most likely missing the game. And so at that point, it became the discussion that everyone talked about was, is Stetson Bennett stepping back in or is Kirby Smart going to go to his future quarterback in, you know, Carson Beck and letting him start? There was a lot of speculation around all that, which we'll get into some of the, you know, conversations over that here as well. But we'll focus on the actual game itself first before we jump into all of that. Um, You know, so. The overall performance by the offense, phenomenal, right? You know, you wanted explosive offenses. You wanted to score a lot of points. I know it's UAB, and so you're looking at, like, a low-level team. You're not looking at a Power 5 opponent, all that good stuff. That's fine. UAB is a team that teams typically don't like being on their schedule because they can be a trap game sometimes. They've, They've been known to do that, and, you know, sometimes they catch you off guard. This year, they didn't. You know, they they don't seem to be that team. Um, I, I think there was a lot more talk about them being better than they ended up being. Now they do have some really big players on their defensive line, yeah. and that showed. That that's a stat, you know, a stat line that go look at Georgia's rushing attempts, you know, and their performance. There were you can't really look at the stat line as much as you can look at the just watching the game and watching our offensive yeah. line 
seamlessly get bullied around by some of their defensive line and missing assignments, all that kind of stuff, whether or not it was that they were outmatched like size wise, or if it was just, you know, missing assignments, whatever it might be, they definitely got challenged by that UAB team for sure. And I think people were looking at like between the first two games of Georgia's um, you're looking at UAB and Clemson and Georgia seamlessly struggled to run the ball, you know, and get chunk run plays. Now, they ended up running for around 183 yards, I believe, against UAB, and it like as a whole. And but that was over the entire game, yeah. you know. And against UAB, it, you know, you kind of thought that, you know, it, it, as a whole, you look at it, it's not that bad. You know, you're thinking 183 yards on the ground is really not bad, but there was not a lot of chunk plays. You look at it, there was 38 rushing attempts to get that. I mean, yeah. you ran the ball almost 40 times which you can expect once you get up big and after Georgia's already lit up the air, you know, when in five pass attempts with four touchdowns, you know, before the, you know, second quarter really even kicked in a minute, less than a minute into the sec- second quarter and you got your fourth touchdown pass. At that point, you're up by a lot. They start running more. You know, we made it, I was making a joke to you beforehand. Stetson only had, to, uh, I think it was 288 yards, you know, total. And in his first pass attempts, he had 245 of those. So he went, you know, five for seven and 43 yards the rest of the way after that. So you can tell, like, after that fourth touchdown, Georgia really kind of backed off and started running it more and tried to get that clock going because one thing that uh, Brooks Austin pointed out in his film review this week on our defensive side is UAB was – some of the players look like they're just about trying to hurt you, you know, with the the cut blocks, which cut blocks are legal in college football – and that's fine. But when you start looking at the cut blocks, not at the offensive line, like right there at the, the meat of the run play like right there, you're looking at open space cut blocks where you're 10, 15 yards away from the line of scrimmage. And all of a sudden you have this guy just diving at the ankles and shins of cornerbacks, uh, you know, defensive ends and, you know, linebackers, all that kind of stuff. And we literally had three Georgia players get hit like that, walk off the field, like in pain two of which came back immediately in the game. But Quay Walker, Quay Walker's suffering with an ankle issue right now. And mm-hmm. the the last play that he played, about five to ten yards upfield, and then like five or ten yards to the left of the line, somebody dove at his ankles for a cut block. Yeah, and it's especially concerning because like when you play teams like UAB, yeah, of course, you want to win. You want to be able to work on some things as well, um, you know, just moving forward, especially if you're Georgia, you're about to get into your SEC schedule. So you really just want to kind of polish things off, really settle in before you before you get into your conference portion of the schedule. But then again, you want to stay healthy. So, again, that's what you that's why you start running the ball a lot, because you're like, OK, we're up 28 points, 35 points at this point. <clears throat> Let's just run the ball, take clock, you know, just make sure we get out of this game healthy. So, yeah, it's it's definitely discouraging, and you hate to see things like that happen when um, players are diving at their knees, which is their assignment probably. They're just doing what they're being told by their offensive what coordinator and coaches. Yeah. But it also just really sucks to see that happen because you don't want someone's career being ended off of a game against UAB where they're getting cut blocked by someone else and probably in, in a portion of the play where they're not really a factor at that point anyways. So, yeah – just really sucks to see, but I'm sure both. But it sounds like all all three of those guys will be okay moving forward, and they may be a little banged up now, but at least going forward, you'll still have them for the re- remainder of the season. So that's good to hear, at least. But yeah, very discouraging to see that in the film breakdown. Yeah, it kind of it, it makes you mad when you watch a little bit, but it, it's pointed out that like the reason they do it is because they're outmatched, you know, physically, and they they can't block one-on-one with these guys in space like that. And so that's how they have to do it. In order to have an effective block to keep the guy from blowing through them around them, they have to cut block. That's what they have to do. So, you know, Brooks even pointed out, he was like, I mean, personally, if it was his football team, he would prefer not schedule opponents like that because that's what they have to do. Because they can't come out there and do that, you know, a normal one-on-one block with a Georgia linebacker. (laughs) They they can't do that in space like that. They, They aren't physically able to keep up that so they have to do it that way in order to compete well he his point of view was and if it was my football team i would prefer schedule with power five opponents because they don't do that usually mm-hmm. um you know you, he said i would prefer put on out of conference game against like syracuse or illinois out there because you can you know feel pretty confident going into it it's not a hundred percent a cupcake but it's still kind of a cupcake for georgia at that point and you don't have to worry about 
players getting taken out because we still had starters late enough into this game, surprisingly. Mm-hmm. Like, and you start looking at them getting hit in the ankles in the third, fourth quarter almost. And you're like, I don't know about that anymore. Yeah. Uh, whether or not they shouldn't be out on the field anymore, but you still, they still need game reps. Is that's where the weird balance is when you're trying to deal with it on the other sideline is. You need them out on the field because they need game reps. It because game speed is different than practice, and even when they scrub and stuff yeah. like that, it's different. It's a different environment with all the fans around. It, they need to kind of settle in before they jump into games like South Carolina coming this weekend. And so they need game reps. So you want to put them out there, but then again, you're looking at the other sideline. And you're going, you know what their play style is. And you're eh, a little bit hesitant. <laughs> Brooks even came out and said he was like, I, I wouldn't schedule UAB on my football team ever again. And if I did, if they ever ended up there again, I'm putting up ninety. <laughs> like I'm gonna put up 90 because like we're being nice and stopping, but like we'll put up 90 if you're gonna play like that. Yeah, and that, I mean that was also a, always a topic when um, Georgia played Georgia Tech with Paul Johnson. There, it was it was never really a concern that Georgia wasn't going to beat Georgia Tech. I mean, just because so many of the years that Paul Johnson was there, Georgia Tech was just really really bad, and Georgia was really good or at least decent enough to where they were. Georgia Tech wasn't much of a matchup for them, but. They cut block every single play. So it was all, and especially late in the season when Georgia's making a run at the SEC championship game or anything like that, it was always a worry that one of your big players gets taken out in that game. So it doesn't help that that's always the 12th game of the season. Yeah. So, that, I mean, that was always a big conversation when Georgia Tech ran that triple option scheme with Paul Johnson as their head coach. So now at least you don't have to worry about that with Georgia Tech anymore. But yeah, I mean, if you're seeing that on the film, and I'm Kirby Smart, I'm definitely saying, like, all right, uh, it was nice to bring you into town and pay you some money to come play us, but I hope we never see you again. And so, yeah, I, I agree with that very much so. I mean, like, yeah, bring the Rutgers into Athens for a game or something like that. Beat them beat them down 56-7 and just move about your business. You can polish up the offense like you did against UAB, against someone like the Rutgers or Syracuse, just like you can against UAB. And you're actually playing against some more high caliber talent as well. So you, you probably benefited more playing against someone like that anyways. So maybe that's a transition you see moving forward for teams like Georgia and whatnot. I mean, Kirby Smart seems to always be looking at options to beef up the schedule and, and make them appear better to the media. So maybe they take away from playing the cupcake games against UAB and Charleston Southern and they start throwing in teams like the Rutgers or Syracuse or other people like that. So maybe that's a new transition. Yeah, I think it's a potential – thing that you'll see more and more especially as like college football evolves <clears throat> excuse me as a whole and people start worrying more about strength of schedule in different ways and they start looking at it like that um the season's already getting expanded and as far as like playoff thing is in the next couple of years so you're going to see some things change there you've already seen georgia add a lot of big out of conference games for the next like 10 years you know they play clemson several times they play oklahoma i believe they play texas a couple times play oregon next play year oregon play ohio state like all in the next 10 years they've scheduled all of that um, I think the reason you don't see as many on these cupcake games and because this was also pointed out by Brooks is they don't want to do a home, like they don't want to schedule these for a home yeah. and home. So they, but what they could do is you're already paying schools like UAB, like a million dollars to come play against you pay Syracuse, yeah. or Illinois, a million dollars to not gonna do use the money anyway. to either have just a one game or do two straight games in Athens. Yeah. You know, whatever, if it makes them want to do it. And it takes a little bit of money to do it that way. You're already spending the money to get UAB and Charleston yeah. Southern out there anyways. So that's uh, – it's worth trying on there. And the kind of comment, because I skipped around this as well, the comment on like the you know Georgia Tech and their play style on there. But when Paul Johnson was there, their style was that triple option. Yeah. And so their recruiting tactics as far as offensive line went was – you know, smaller guys. Mm-hmm. More so mobile Because they're guys, more mobile yeah. getting around like that kind of stuff. They weren't big guys. And so that my comment before about, you know, a size matchup, the physicality matchup in a one-on-one situation with a big Georgia lineman or a big Georgia linebacker, they can't, they couldn't do it in the same way. So that was why their, their style was to cut block. I mean, and, yeah. and it's legal. It is until you become like, until it's a chop block where somebody's engaged in a block up here and then they get hit in the legs and that's when it's illegal. But once again, when it's inside the box like that and it's at the line of scrimmage, you know, your big guys, will, they'll fall, you know, they'll mm-hmm. go down like whatever. But when it's out in space and you're diving directly at the shins, that's when yeah. it's a problem. You know, it, it, cut blocking is what it is. You know, I understand you you don't have the size matchup, so you need to use it. That's fine in most situations. That open space and a direct dive. Do- I mean, I'm talking, watch, the, like, when Quay got hurt, the guy takes his helmet almost directly into the shins yeah. of him. It wasn't even like a just trying to sweep the leg. It was like directly into the shin. 
And that's, I mean, you're going to break somebody's leg. You, that's what makes me go back and think about injuries like Alex Smith, where his leg got shattered. And, it, and then um, Mackenzie Milton, where his leg got yeah. messed up. It's the direct hits into the shin area on those players. That's what happens with that type of play. And that's mm-hmm. what you're scared of when you're playing against a team like that. Definitely. So, I mean, yeah, fork over the same money that you give to these teams to not have to do a home and home with the Syracuse or Illinois if you really want to do it that way. Yeah. I completely agree with that. I mean, I I could care less if we ever play UAB again. It doesn't make much difference to me. And so I don't think it would make much difference to any of the players or coaches if we ever play UAB again. So, And, I mean, it comes down to a balance for the coaching staff to evaluate on their program. When you're looking at, like, a Kirby Smart and the situation of he's he's got to build his schedule and what he wants to play, he looks at it and he goes, what's the trade-off here? You know, playing a team that's what everyone would consider to be a strong cupcake game is it worth getting out there to get some young guys, some extra reps in that facet of it? Or is it worth, you know, trying to play a little bit better of an opponent that's still in the power five, get some better snap, you know, opportunities for those same young guys, because make sure you schedule against teams that you don't expect to be, you know, exactly big names or going crazy. And, you know, go, go get those lower level teams from the big 10, from, you know, the ACC, even from stuff like that. And, do it that way, mm-hmm. you know, then you get to have those games. Plus people want to watch them more. I'd be more engaged in that type of game as a Georgia fan. How many of you Georgia fans actually want to sit here and watch a UAB Georgia game where, I mean, yeah, it's fun to watch your team score a lot of points. How engaged are you the entire time you're watching that game? Are you watching every single play? I'm sure a lot of you are. Would you much rather watch every single play of a game against a power five opponent? Personally, I would. Yes. Yeah, I think I, I think it'd be much better. Yeah. You know, I'm not saying expand the schedule to 10 SEC games. You can keep it at eight SEC games and play four out-of-conference opponents with one always being Georgia Tech. But let's not go out and schedule a bunch of teams like UAB and Charleston Southern all the time because I think it's more beneficial to your football program if you go get at least a Power 5. Once again, don't go get Ohio State, you know, or two teams like that every single year. Mm-hmm. But go get, you know, some teams at the lower level. At Virginia Tech, you know, we just played them last year. Um, no. We're supposed to. We were to. supposed to play Virginia Tech last year. They were on the schedule. Games like that, like, yeah, they're not, like, the bottom tier of, you know, the ACC. But when you look at that schedule, you don't think Georgia's going to have any chance of losing that game. Yeah. You know, maybe even schedule a little bit lower in there and go for a Syracuse, you know, that type of team. It's more fun to watch as a fan as well. And plus, I, I genuinely, I'm not a coach. I, I didn't play in college, that kind of thing. I don't know what their mindset is in that side of it. But to me, I, I think those would be much more meaningful snaps to get rather than playing UAB, where in five pass attempts, we already have 245 yards passing and four touchdowns because all of those plays, except, no, all of those plays, there was like 10 plus yards of cushion for the wide receiver immediately. Yeah. So, to me, it'd be more fun to watch as a fan. I mean, you had JT Daniels on the sideline, literally throwing his hands up in the air as soon as Arian Smith broke broke off the line the of ball scrimmage. Was snapped. Yeah, it as literally was snapped, was and snapped. Smith took off, and JT Daniels on the sideline already had his hands up for a touchdown because he knew it. I mean, no one, nobody on UAB was going to keep up with Arian Smith down the sideline, or or heck, they couldn't even keep with Brock Bowers going down the sideline. So that just kind of mm-hmm. tells you the kind of mismatch that Georgia had offensively against UAB. So I mean. Yeah. And while we're on that subject, too, speaking of Brock Bowers, oh, my. Bad, bad man. I mean, you're looking at a guy that is extremely fast, extremely strong. It, it, he's explosive enough himself at a tight end position. And you're just looking back and going, good God. I mean, he Brock Bowers is the guy that every Georgia fan has been waiting for at the tight end position. Um I actually wrote an article on it this last week about how the transformation of the tight end position and what Todd Hartley has Todd Hartley has done at UGA since he got here um, in 2019. <clears throat> I mean, he went out and got Darnell Washington, who's just golly. I mean, that's, that's all you can say when you look at Darnell Washington. And then you go and get Brock Bowers as well. And the great thing about both of those guys is that they both excel at different things. And so when you can put them both in the game at the same time, which they will do a lot when Darnell Washington is healthy, you're going to be able to put Brock Bowers in the slot because he just has incredible speed. That's a mismatch on the field. And then you're going to put Darnell Washington off the end of the line, and he's a mismatch there as well. So you already have automatically have two mismatches 
already for your receiving core when you have both of those guys on the field. So, I mean, I mean, that is incredible just to even think about what Todd Munkin is thinking about doing with both of those guys, plays that they have drawn up with both of them on the field. So that's something that Georgia fans should be really excited about. And it's just, it's just insane to think about it because I mean, three years ago, it was like the narrative was that, Oh my gosh, we just don't use our tight ends. Like they block for us. They may catch a 16 yard pass down the middle every now and then. And now your true freshman tight end is leading the team in both receptions and receiving yards and is also leading and also led the team in both games and both of those stats as well. I mean, a true freshman tight end, first first pass of the entire season was thrown to Brock, Brock Bowers. So it's just incredible to see how quickly t- uh, Todd Hartley has transitioned this, this position group and then also how quickly he's developing them. I mean, to have your true freshman – look this good stud. in the first two games. I mean, that that is insane to think about. I mean, I think the stat came out that he topped out at 21 miles per hour on his 86-yard touchdown run. God, 21 miles that. per hour. He was the only tight end on the list. There was five of them. One of them was a quarterback. The other two, I think, were running backs. Another one was a wide receiver. And Brock Bowers was a tight end. Third quickest player on the last weekend at 21 miles per hour. I mean, you looked at it, and I mean, that's that four or five speed kind of tied in all of a sudden, like, yeah. which is unreal for the guy that's his size to be running that fast. And when you watch that play again, which it was that fake truck sweep, which we ran the truck sweep a couple times, tossing it out to the running back, going out to the flats. We ran that play two or three times before, and then they'd faked it and had him roll out to, you know, kind of a wheel route down the right side, wide open because UAB fell for it entirely. But then the safety had him on a a line like he had the angle had the angle the whole he time he had the angle and you're talking a safety trying to run like with a a tight end there's no safety that should not be able to run with a tight end <laughs> unless that tight end's running 21 miles an hour which he was and just says screw your angle yeah just shove your angle somewhere because i'm gone that man was flying yeah. i couldn't i was like all right he's going to get 40 yards Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, I start seeing the, the safety come in the screen like this. And slowly gets behind You him. saw Brock Bowers just passing. And I'm like, how? Yeah, that just how, be- how did he manage to do that? I mean, it was amazing to watch because I'm with you. I, I remember, and I, was, I think all fans kind of looked at it and got tired of seeing the Georgia tight ends that, you know, didn't really get involved in the pass game for the past several years. And some even started to say that, you know, that um, – you didn't even want to use them. You know, Kirby didn't want to use the tight ends, which I don't think was the case. I think he just didn't have those tight ends on the roster. Yeah. I think the the biggest issue there was, you, everyone thinks about like Isaac Nada, who mm-hmm. was a five-star tight end. Everyone was extremely Big excited. Came high in, yeah, came in with Jacob Eason, you know, at the same time. There was a lot of talk about him and how he was. Like, it just, he had raw talent, just didn't, you know, sometimes the effort may not have been there and stuff. So they didn't do it all that much, and, and they kind of did things differently with him. He wasn't the type of player that they wanted for that. And once again, that was a, you know, same class as Eason, which was not, you know, Kirby Smart's recruiting class. Like, he, he wasn't recruited by, like, Kirby Smart. No. So he came on the roster that way. This is – these are his guys. You got Darnell Washington was a freshman last year. This year you got Brock Bowers. Next year, you're hoping that Georgia lands Oscar Delp, who has been a Georgia, you know, there's been a lot of talk about him in general. He, he hasn't made an official decision. Yet, but in you, good position, though, you're in good You're in good position with a guy like Oscar Delp. And then you've got other people like that. That's who they're going after. Then they're, have, they're the same type of player, yeah. which Oscar Delp was at the Clemson game. Yep. He's watching this game, and he's looking at, like, one question that everyone had because we hadn't really done it much, even last year until the end of the season when we got into the last few games. I think Missouri was the first game where I remember seeing Darnell get a lot more involved in the passing game where he started making a lot more plays. And then by the time we got to, you know, the bowl game against Cincinnati, all of a sudden you start seeing a lot more of his involvement, a lot of plays to try to get him the ball in space. There's a reason for that. You know, actually, I I talked to him uh, Darnell, I, I talked to him right before, I think it was the week before the G-Day game. I met him and I was asking him some, you know, little questions here and there. And one thing, and it, it played out. I didn't, you know, go out and say everything that this kid told me, but it, I mean, it played out. They drew up more screenplays to tight ends. That's what he told me they were doing, that they were working on and that Todd Munkin was trying to get more involved with the tight ends and stuff. And he was like, you, you always, you hear it. And I'm like, that's, that's extremely exciting to think about and to, to hear immediately implemented it into the game plan this season. 
Clemson, they did it a few times where Brock Bowers got the ball in, in open space and screen plays. Mm-hmm. And then it same thing was happening, you know, against UAB. He had a, uh, his one play that wasn't a touchdown was a screen pass. He caught it in traffic and made a nice play with his legs on it. The other two catches, he had three total catches. I think it was 107 yards. And so the only one that wasn't one of those two touchdown plays was a screen pass to him. Seeing that involved in the offensive game plan immediately, it completely gets rid of the narrative of Georgia not wanting to use their tight ends. And it shows players like Oscar Delp and future recruits that, hey, we're very capable of using our tight ends like other players are being used around the country, like certain NFL stars that you want to be like that are doing it. That's We're doing that. Come on, we'll do it with you too. Yeah, and then even to add on with Oscar Delp, the following year you currently have a verbal commitment from Pierce Berlin right now as well, who's also another big-name tight end coming out of that 2023 class. So the number of tight ends that you're going to be able to use at Georgia is only going to continue to grow, and these prospects are definitely paying attention to Georgia using their tight ends. I mean, so – and then also going back, I mean – it was obvious that Georgia wanted to use their tight ends or else you don't recruit a guy like Darnell Washington and you don't recruit a guy like Brock Bowers. And so, I mean, there was two years where, one, you brought in Eli Wolf from Tennessee, a, a graduate transfer, and then another year where you bring in Trey McKitty, who was also another graduate transfer. So those are two years, obviously, where Georgia's like, we just need a filler year. I mean, like, we, we have we have guys that we believe in, obviously, but we just need another filler year. So, like, those are guys that you're not necessarily bringing in to be game breakers or anything by that means you're just trying to buy your program some time, you know, buy some time for Darnell Washington to get his feet wet in the offense, get some game game in game reps without actually having to just throw him out there to the wolves and start him. So now that you have a Darnell Washington who is hurt anyways, and you end up having to throw the true freshman out there anyways, but you had yourself in a position where you had a Darnell Washington with a year under his belt and then also a true freshman Brock Bowers. So, but now it's it's worked out for you even better. Brock Bowers has gotten plenty of game reps, and he's only going to continue to get better as the season goes on, as scary as that is. And then you're going to get Darnell Washington back here pretty soon, who is just itching to get on the field, I'm pretty sure. I mean, he's got to be watching Brock Bowers right now like, man, I want to get in on the mix of that. And I'm sure JT Daniels or whoever's under center during that time is going to be glad to have him back on the field as well. And then also you talking about using the, the truck sweep – I think that just goes to show you how creative Todd Munkin is. I mean, Georgia used a truck sweep play against Florida early on in the game, scored like a 60-yard touchdown off of it. And so it just shows you that he sets teams up so many times. You know, you go back and watch the film probably, and you're like, all right, Georgia really likes to use this truck sweep motion to really get the run game going. Well, then you open it up and you fake the truck sweep, and then boom, you hit Brock Bowers down the sideline for 80 yards. So I, I think also it shows that Todd Munkin knows how to use his tight ends and he has such creative ways to use them because which other teams do you see throwing to your tight end in a screenplay? You don't see a whole lot of them. You see him throwing to a guy like Ladd McConkey or Jermaine Burton, but never someone like Brock Bowers. So, but there's not that many tight ends that can run. No, a exactly my and point. That's, that's what's insane about exactly this type my of, point. of tight end. Yeah, You have a special player in Brock Bowers who is going to be playing football for a very long time, even after his time at Georgia, and you have another one in Darnell Washington. So, boy, oh boy, is that tight end room looking absolutely dangerous. All the talk was about the wide receiver unit, but now everybody's like, good Lord, this Georgia tight end unit is looking absolutely ridiculous right now. It just adds to the weaponry that they're going to have once everybody's healthy and in that lineup, you know, once they get, think about it, once they get Darnell Washington back. Darnell is a little bit more of your stronger physical, um, you know, tight end. He's still fast and he can still move, you know, surprisingly well for a guy that's six foot seven, six foot eight, um, you know, ridiculous size. So he's still, he's still that kind of, kind of guy too. But when you add that in and then you put a guy next to him in a Brock Bowers, it's extremely hard to game plan against. And I agree to go back, a, a, you know, a couple minutes into your, your talking there was, with you know the extra guys we plugged in, I think Trey McKitty, uh, he we tried to get him more involved in the pass game too, but he was getting hurt and stuff like that. So we were yeah. dealing with that with him. And then Eli Wolf, I think we tried to get Eli Wolf more involved in the passing game. But think back to when he was there, he, he there was a few big drops that he had, yeah. and I think that kind of limited. They started to get worried about his ability to actually catch the ball, so they stopped drawing them up as much. So now you've got guys like you. You gave Darnell some time last year to really develop into the offense to get used to it, and then you started seeing the ball get into his hands more. And then you have Brock Bowers, who immediately they've put into this offense and, and gotten him heavily involved. You've got guys coming in in the future. That's that's what their game plan is. And, and you're right. The, the truck sweep is a beautiful play design for your tight ends because it does open up a lot. Think about it. like the truck sweep is if you did, if you don't recognize it off like us talking about it and seeing it. 
it's you know lined up in like a shotgun formation with your running back, and then they pitch it out to the side, like a toss play out to the boundary. Well, and that's the probably a terrible way to describe it. I'm sure <laughs> Brooks would probably kill me. We're not that. Brooks Austin. I'm so not going to break it down like that. We but can't break you get it down essentially you. you get the point. So when you do that two three times in a game, what that does is you're going to create your linebackers. You know they're they're going to start moving that direction when they see that motion. They're going when you see the quarterback go like this and it looks and they've seen it three times where you've you've done that play. They have to start respecting it and start moving that direction. Well, what happens is they start to either move to the side or they start moving down. If they start moving down, that's when it really benefits you on a route like that because then he hit that wheel route up the side. There was nobody in the, the cornerbacks had come in, the linebackers had come in, and the safety was in the middle of the field. So he had been already occupied by a crossing route, a post route by Jermaine Burton, I believe. And at that point, he's wide open. Same thing goes like if they want to do a different type of play. If, if you want to slip over there and have him you know, block and release, hit one guy and then release up the seam, depending on what your defensive coverage looks like, if, if their safeties are split and, and whatnot, you can do the same type of play design, fake, and you have a tight end open down the middle of the field. Mm -hmm. it, that's a great play to get your tight ends involved because the linebackers and corners have to respect it if you do it three times already. Yeah. They can't just sit here and say, oh, it's got to be a fake. They don't run that. They know you run that play. They have to respect it. So that's an incredible way to get him involved. I mean, I, I think it's been just watching that game alone. It was awesome to see some of the guys get involved that are younger, that are you know, less experienced that we hadn't wouldn't have been able to see had everybody been healthy as much. You know, you got Lad McConkey out here making massive plays in his he got one catch, I believe, and it was like 35 yards, and he made a lot of people miss and he was wiggling around, showing serious speed. Doing what he does. Doing what he does. And it was just fun to watch. You know, Arian Smith had that huge touchdown. That was his one catch. Georgia had six touchdown passes to five different receivers and Brock Rowers was the one that had two. And by the way, his second touchdown catch, Stetson Bennett threw that thing on a frozen rope yeah i mean it was a missile and just perfect throw by him um and it was just it was fun to watch so i mean it was it was a good game overall for georgia when you look at it like that relatively came out healthy after the game outside yeah. of you know no major injuries. no major injuries that people aren't expected to be available you know roughly this weekend on and then on defense we didn't go too too much into defense yet we talked a lot about the offensive side so far so on the defensive side you know there were some big performances latavius Bernie, i really love watching him make those plays in the flats. He's always running downhill so heavy, you know, and he's always – he's so quick. He's so fast. Very instinctual too. He is. And so when you have a guy like Tyke Smith out and you're looking at him to take over that role, after the Cincinnati game, we already kind of started to see what he could do. And then you've given him the opportunity in two games this year, and he's, he's done nothing but impress on it to me. Yep. Um, I've been happy to see what he's done. You know, Keely Ringo had himself a pick. You know, after last week where he got picked on a little bit with his two pass interference, once again, we talked about that. We won't go down that road too much. But I mean, he's a young guy and he's, you know, in a big game against Clemson, stuff like that happens. Yep. Everyone went all over social media and talked bad about him. The kid's good. The, the kid is, is going talented. to be incredible. He's going to be one of the best cornerbacks to come through Georgia by the time he's done in three to four years. So just he's going to give him some time to develop. He, he hadn't played a game in two years. And then the last one he played was in high school. Yep. So it, give him some time. Let, stuff like that will be more often. You'll you'll see it. Um, it's it's great to see. And then players like Amir Speed, who's showing up at cornerback, that he really did it the right way. He sat there and waited. He didn't transfer out. He sat there for years. And now it's his turn to step up and do something. And he's making – everyone always looked at um, seeing who the cornerbacks were going to be. We talked about it. We talked about the cornerback situation going into the year. And we said it was going to be Keely Ringo. And, you know, Darian Kendrick, which it is for the most part, but they rotate a lot at that position. Amir Speed has shown that he deserves to be getting a lot of those reps on the field as well. Absolutely. And it's been really good to see. But I think as Georgia fans, and I'm including myself in this because we can all do this, it's really easy to look at the new guy coming in yep. and you see that they're four or five star. You see the stuff that they've done in high school and they're, you're super excited to see them on the field. Right. That's what we did. I think that's what everybody did. That's what I did. And that's what you did. And I think and, and on the show, which we, we weren't talking bad about Amir Speed. We even did say that we, we could see Amir Speed being one of the two starters for the first game against Clemson because of an experience thing, because of the type of game that it was. So I'm not surprised to see him get playing time. I am surprised, and I shouldn't be, but I am a little surprised to see how well he's performed in that opportunity he's been given. I think he's earned it. I, I love seeing a guy like him perform at such a high level. 
Yeah, I think you have Georgia now has a great problem to have because now when Tyke Smith comes back, now you're probably thinking like we have to find a way to get Latavius Brini out there as well. I mean, he's making plays for us all over the field. Like we have to find a way to make sure that he's on the field some way because we can't keep a player like that off the field. And then also the same thing now with your cornerbacks. You know, cornerbacks was a big question coming in the season for Georgia. Some inexperience there, having to play guys like we said, Keely Ringo hadn't played in a while. But now you're like, okay, Amir Speed playing really well for us. Keely Ringo, he's showing flashes of him playing really well. Only going to get better as the season goes on. And then Darian Kendrick is doing what everybody expected him to do. And it's just absolutely balling out and holding his guys down. So it's a great problem for Georgia to have. I mean, depth is what you need on a defense. And Georgia loves to rotate guys, especially up in their front seven. So now you have a problem where you need to just find places for guys to be on the field. So that's a great problem for Dan Lanning and Kirby Smart to have. And so then – um, but – so I actually tweeted this stat out just to give you an idea of how well Georgia's defense has been playing this year. Um, if Georgia's offense never set foot on the field in the Clemson game or in the UAB game, just never came on the field, Georgia's defense plays the entire game, Georgia is still 2-0 on the year. They beat, they would have beat Clemson 7-3 thanks to a um, Chris Smith pick six. And then this last week, you would have beat UAB 7-0 thanks to a Jamon Dumas Johnson pick six late in the fourth quarter. Which means also if the offense never comes out, the pick six for UAB never happens. Hence why it'd be seven zero. So I mean that, that just tells you Incredible. everything you need to know about Georgia's defense. I mean they, they're averaging one point five points allowed per game right now in two games because they gave up three to Clemson. They've given up zero touchdowns so far, and that trend very well could go into this weekend as well. I believe. I think there's a very high likelihood of that happening again. Um, what so, was it? Um, sorry to cut you off. What was last year? Or the I think it was last year or the year before. Um, maybe it was the year before because last year was a little different. There was like eight games in before Georgia gave up a rushing touchdown. It was some like it might have been like Florida or I got think past it extended Florida. over a whole season actually. It, it, I think they scored a rushing touchdown late in the year. Somebody yeah, did by a running back. By it was a running by, back, yes. It was, but yeah, because you can't count the quarterback sneak at the goal line. Yeah. It was like a running back had not scored a rushing touchdown against Georgia. So they, and, that just shows how stout that defensive line is. And then you start adding year. talent. And they're still they're still that talented on the defensive yep. line and, and linebacker set like that front seven we've talked about that so you have those and then you add in some talent at corner and safety unreal talent at those positions that are some of the guys are young and some of them haven't had as much playing time but the talent's very much there it could go a while before teams start scoring offensive touchdowns on yep. Georgia and you have look at the next couple of games here when you go you know, South you know, Carolina and Vanderbilt South Carolina and Vanderbilt. Plus, I mean, Vanderbilt's we, not scoring a touchdown. Georgia's putting up 90 on Vanderbilt. And South Carolina, <laughs> with their grad trans, or grad assistant quarterback, who they yeah. barely beat Eastern Carolina last or last week, they're not scoring on you that much either if they score at all. It, they, they're probably kicking field goals if they get in the field goal range. Yeah, and I mean, I said this way back when. I mean, this might have been back in January or February when I said this, but it was when we were having the discussion about, like, all right, cornerback is obviously the biggest worry for Georgia – for defense wise going into the season. And I said, well, I was like, the good thing is you're about to have a ridiculous defensive line and linebacker unit. Because what's what's a great pair for inexperienced quarterback unit? Give Your a bull rush friend. and get into the quarterback and put some pressure on the quarterback. And that's exactly what Jordan's done this year. So what is it, 10 sacks already this year? We yeah, had seven so, in the first game. Something crazy like that. Three on Saturday and seven in the first game. And it's not even game. necessarily the sacks. The sacks are great, of course, it's as well. Right. It's just pressure in the quarterback and they were doing that every single play so that also means that your cornerbacks feel a little more loose out there they're not they're not playing tight because they're not really worried about having to cover their man for six or seven seconds or five or whatever they just know like all right if i can just cover my man for the first four seconds i know my defensive line or linebacker is getting to the quarterback by then so that's a great thing that georgia also has on defense going for them is that yeah they do have some inexperience at cornerback but they also have probably college football's best front seven at this point. I would say at this point, you know, going into the season, the argument was Georgia and Clemson probably one and two with Clemson possibly having the better front seven at this, at this point, And after watching the first game against Clemson and seeing what happened there. And then, you know, the second game of the season, yeah, UAB, but still you can see a lot of what they're doing. They probably have the best front seven yeah. in college football. That is the absolute best way to counteract having an inexperienced secondary yep. because they don't have to cover long. They only have to cover for two, three seconds max because you've already hit the quarterback. And when they are throwing it, they're getting hit and throwing it up. And Lewis Seen has a pick because yep. the ball's just floated up in the air because Stackhouse over here hitting the quarterback, another young guy too, not even, you know, a senior or upperclassman, a young guy out there um, making plays 
And it's just, it's one of those things that that's the absolute best way to counteract it. And that's exactly what they have. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the biggest question mark going into the season on defense for Georgia was their, their secondary. If they could figure that out and make that a non-issue, Georgia's defense is going to be unreal. Absolutely. It's not an issue outside of some young mistakes from a cornerback that may have a, you know, a pass interference or something like that. One thing that you have not seen is busted coverages. In two games, there's not been a ton of busted coverages from cornerbacks. You really don't, you don't see wide receivers open by 10 yards unless they're on those crossing routes and stuff like something short. Like, yeah, they get some separation there. You don't. There's not one huge pass play downfield against Georgia's passing game or uh, secondary. And that's because, I mean, Kirby Smart and Dan Lanning do such a good job of coaching their guys to limit those big plays. <clears throat> I mean – I like I, I said this going into the Clemson week. You know, like the only time last year that you ever saw um, Georgia secondary get beat for a big play over the top was the play where I, th- I believe it was Trey K- or Tyson Campbell that tripped up on his man against Alabama and Devontae Smith took it to the house for like eighty yards. I mean, that was really the only time you ever saw an offense just completely take the top off Georgia's secondary. So Dan Lanning and Kirby Smart do, or, or not even Dan Lanning, sorry, but um. Um, Jamal Adai does a really good job coaching those their cornerbacks and their secondary to pr- protect their defense from that because they're fine with giving you everything underneath. You know, if they give up five or ten yards on a little under route, that's fine. You, what you can't have is have them beat you for 80 yards down the field, much like what George is doing to, did to UAB's defense numerous times. So that, a lot of credit goes to the, the defensive back coach and Kirby Smart for just preparing their guy, those guys and making sure that that doesn't happen in those games. Now, granted – UAB is probably not a team that's going to be able to do that to you against. But, I mean, it's at least getting you prepared and in-game reps of protecting your def- protecting yourselves from that from that happening against a Florida or whoever else you play later on in the season. So I think that really just has a lot to do with how well Kirby Smart and um, Jamal Adai do coaching their team and coaching those guys up. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's incredible to watch. I'm excited to see how it plays out through the entire course of the season as we start getting into SEC play and you start seeing games – you know, this weekend, once again, is South Carolina, but we still get into the game against South Carolina with Georgia this year. And it's going to be a fun one to watch because last time they were in Athens, they beat Georgia. And it was a game that just did not look good, did not look good. I sat here, you know, last week even talking about like the letdown games from Kirby. That's the one game that I give credit to say is a letdown game, like a big letdown game. I'm giving Georgia some, you know, credit on the other two games that people usually talk about with it, even though Brooks Austin today, he was talking, he called them all let down, which I mean, they, they kind of are in a way, but as far as like one that you should be concerned, concerned about versus one that, you know, you really just shouldn't have lost versus some games that, you know, yeah, they were still good teams at least. Um, that's the difference for me. But this one, it, there's, I don't know if you saw it. It was on Twitter. I wish I had pulled the video and I could have played it, but there was a video that came out from, it was Kirby Smart being interviewed before the South Carolina game last year. And he was talking to Chuck Dowdle, and he literally said before that game, our team's not ready to play right now. They don't. Look, I'm watching warm-ups. They don't look ready to play. We got to get ready to play. In warm-ups, while he was talking to Chuck Dowdle, he said, my team right now isn't ready to play, and we need to get them ready to play for this game before this game kicks off. Recently, he sat down with the same people, not with Chuck Dowdle, because he's not doing that right now. And um, I can't remember who he sat down with, but he sat down and he, he talked to the same, you know, people overall. And he said, you know, they had him elaborate on it. He said it, it, they were prepared in practice. And he said it being prepared like during the week versus being prepared on game day are two different things. It, during week, they had good practices. They were playing well all week. That wasn't the issue. But something about that day when they were warming up, they were getting out there. They weren't hitting people. You know, they weren't like in warmups. They weren't they didn't have it. They, it wasn't there he just could see it and he just knew that there was an issue and he was like, I, we need to figure that. He said it before the game even kicked off. He said, we need to fix it before this game kicks off. They're not ready to play right now. Boy, were they not ready to play in that game? He said, and his thing, he said, I don't know if it, you know, sometimes that early kickoff is hard to get, you know, people going for it's, it's a noon game and you know, it's, it's hard to get them ready to go sometimes for that. But, um, for some reason, they just weren't. And that's not an excuse. It just says that, like, he noticed it before the game, and it played out that way. And, yeah, that's that's his job. He needs to make sure they're ready that day. So that does fall back to Kirby Smart. So that was that was an interesting comment. I'll have to pull the video 
and show you. Um, but that, he posted it on Twitter. Um, I saw it yesterday, I believe. And he literally said they weren't ready for that game before the game kicked off after warmups. Yeah, I mean, and that's something you that's very, very rarely going to happen under someone like Kirby Smart, where he says, my team is not ready to play right now. I mean, Kirby is one of the best coaches at making sure his team is prepared for just about anything and everything coming into the game, coming into game day. And then also, he's just such a high energy guy, like he's always going to have his team motivated to play, ready to play. And he always has them in the right mindset. I mean, there's a reason why when Georgia players are interviewed, they essentially give you the same answer every single time. Like, you know, like, oh, how'd you feel about being Clemson? Like, oh, yeah, that was great. But, you know, we're focused on UAB now. Like, on we have the next one. We have, we, have, we have unfinished business, as we heard all season long from every single player. Like, we have business to take care of. Like, we had to come here and take care of business. Now we have to go home and take care of business and get ready for UAB. There's a reason why every single player essentially tells you the same thing. It's because Kirby Smart does such a good job preparing his players, making sure that they are constantly in the right mindset. Because, I mean, we've seen it time and time again, as we did in South Carolina against South Carolina that one game. You have a mind slip up for that one game, and heck, boy, does it put you behind the eight ball for the rest of the year. And that just makes things even harder on you. So especially for this year, when we know how big of an advantage it is if Georgia is able to take care of business every single week on the remaining of the schedule. So – it's just, it, and I think that I think it's showing that Kirby Smart has his guys in the right mindset, and they know exactly what they have to do. I mean, I made it. I was talking to someone um, this last weekend, and I was like, you know what? I honestly can't even tell you the last time Georgia dominated an opponent like UAB like that. Like Georgia, of course, handles business when it comes to UAB or opponents like that, but I couldn't remember a time where UJ just from the jump absolutely just put the throttle down and never let up against someone like UAB and was just dumping touchdowns on top of their head almost every single play it felt like and then on defense just wouldn't even allowing them to move the ball I mean it had been a while for me since it felt like we had done, that Georgia had beat an opponent like UAB the way they did on Saturday so I think it's very evident that these guys are motivated they know exactly what their goal is, and they are doing everything they can to make sure that it happens. And it, and if they don't care who's in front of them, it, it doesn't matter. They're going to take care of it, and they're going to put put your face in the ground. It doesn't matter how they have to do it. They're going to find a they're going to find a way to do it. You know how you make sure you don't have that same type of situation going into a South Carolina game. Two things: one, you got beat from them, you know, in Athens last time. They're not going to let that happen again. The players aren't going. The people that are there, the players that are still there for the past couple of years that were there two years ago, they will not let that happen again, number one. Number two, it's a 7.30 kickoff. Night game. There's no way Georgia goes out there and is not super motivated. It's a night game, and it's exciting. First one of the season. First in one, Athens. First home game at night in the season of the season. You're going to have 93,000 packed in. You're going to have so much noise, so much excitement. There's no way they come out there in warm-ups and aren't already pumped up when the fans are already screaming and yelling. When they come out in warm-ups and they, they see certain players out there, that that stuff is – they're going to be extremely motivated. I, I promise you that Kirby Smart does not have anything to worry about as far as players coming out in warm-ups and not looking like they're ready to play. That's not going to have – that's not going to happen this week. And well, and I think that this is a perfect example, and I think it tells you just like how much energy this team has right now is – you posted the clip actually on the podcast account, I believe. Of it was during a timeout, and Kirby Smart and them were talking to the defense, and um, if the song is called "Duck or You Buck" or something like that. I can't remember the name of the song. I, I I'll get it's, flamed for that probably. You will. I'm gonna make sure I put that one up. But anyways, yeah, I did tweet it, so it's out there. Go back and see. Anyways, if, if you want to correct me on what the song is called or whatever, I don't know. But anyways, not the point. Not the point. Anyways. So the song's playing, it's blasting, and you have players jumping up and down in the huddle, just dancing around. Warren Brinson was just on the outside of the huddle, letting the moves go. He's just, who I pointed out in the Just video. absolutely vibing. And um, Nazir Stackhouse is giving the truck horn, as Brooks Austin put it, or Julian Rochester was doing that. I mean, those guys were just excited. I mean, they're playing UAB at 3.30, and it's a day game in Sanford Stadium. But those guys were amped up to be playing football. And they were just – you could just tell their energy level was high. So – I mean, that's a perfect example just to show you of the mindset that these guys have. So they're having fun, their energy is high, and they are just locked in of what their job Warren is. Warren Brinson was feeling it. He was absolutely feeling it. Go watch the video. He was absolutely feeling it, and I tweeted at it. He actually, he actually liked it. He liked the video. Well, there you go. Um, and so he thought it was funny too, at least. But he was absolutely feeling it and getting into it. But that's the stuff you don't see. That's what, you know, once they put the DJ in there, that's the kind of stuff that they're trying to kick up and have that kind of stuff play. 
Um, it, it gets the players a little more excited. It's fun. They, they enjoy it. That's the kind of stuff when you're playing against a team like UAB, you want your team to be involved. It's, it's the environment that keeps them ready to play. Playing in Sanford Stadium, you know, after a season like last year, the fans were extremely ready, even for a UAB game. The players were really ready for it, and they were ready to play in that game. Yeah, and it's nuck if you buck. All right, I'll correct myself. That way nobody can flame me anymore. Okay, I corrected myself, all right? So I don't want to hear anything about it. I'm still clipping that one. I, I may be uncultured compared to you other people, but, you know, I, I corrected myself. But, yeah. Well, I think we're, we're just ready for this game on Saturday in, in general. SEC you'll season, see baby. The season kickoff, and you'll see what happens. I've got two little points that I'll, we'll wrap everything up with for our soapbox moments, and then I'm going to kick it back at Jonathan here in a minute too. Um there was, you know, an article came out, which the article itself is overreactions after week two, right? That is exactly what they're supposed to be. So in in uh, Mark, what's his uh, last name? Mark Schlebach. Mark Schlebach. In his defense, when he writes these, it is literally being written as overreactions that people are saying and he's hearing and so he's writing them out. So it's not necessarily him going out there saying that is exactly what's going on. It is the overreactions from week two. The overreaction that came out from this game was around the quarterback situation with Georgia. And you have people coming out here saying that there is a quarterback controversy in Athens because of what Stetson Bennett did, which I like Stetson Bennett. Okay. He has been solid for Georgia overall. No, he's not what we want in a starting quarterback for an entire season. But when you come into a one game against UAB or you, you have him play two, three games in a season with, you know, something going on outside of when we go up against, you know, Alabama – Alabama is the only game that, you know, was really not good on his side that he just struggled in, and it really was overmatched for him. Even Florida, we were up by 14 points when he hurt his shoulder. You know, we were winning that game. So, you no know, telling what happens if he doesn't mess up his throwing shoulder and keep stuff going when Georgia's up 14 nothing. I think, at that point. So, he's a good quarterback. He's not a great quarterback for Georgia long term, but he is a decent and good quarterback. But he was playing UAB. And our wide receivers on three of his four touchdown passes, well, no, all four of his first touchdown passes had ten, like ten yards of separation. Mm -hmm. You know, between Jermaine Burton's deep ball, you, the the shorter one still had a lot of room. Was to Kenny McIntosh, you know, on that little dump off pass to him, but he still had so much room to you know have it put in his hands. And then you had Brock Bowers on his long one, and Arian Smith on his massive touchdown. They were wide open by ten plus yards. Like you said with the Arian Smith one, when the ball was snapped, literally the ball, watch, go watch the play. The second the ball leaves the center's hands, JT Daniels on the side doing this. And he held it the entire time because he knew based on the alignment of the defense, based on like what player was about to be running, he knew that the player was about to be, Arian Smith was about to be wide open and boy was he. And it, it was a great throw. That was probably the best throw, to be fair, that Stetson made all game because he had pressure in his face and got hit as he, like right before, right after he threw the ball. And it was a deep throw, perfectly on the run in like the bat. Like I mean, he Arian Smith caught it with full extension of his arms like this. It was a good throw and in stride and just gone. If he threw it behind him, the defender has a chance to catch up to him and everything like that. It was a great throw. There is not a quarterback controversy for QB1 in Athens. If there is a quarterback controversy, it's about QB2. There's not a quarterback controversy between JT Daniels and Stetson Bennett because of how Stetson Bennett played against UAB. JT Daniels would have done the exact same thing because he would have made the exact same throws. The plays would have been the same. Like it, There was no – it was an overreaction. But to be fair, Robert Griffin III during the game is sitting here saying that there's a potential quarterback – controversy in Athens. And I can't remember who the other commentator was with him, but it was funny. At one point he goes, uh, he said, hey, I'm pretty sure the team, I'm pretty sure it's JT's <laughs> team. Um, and he's not, you know, I don't think there's actually, he, it was like, I think it was like the third time that Robert Griffin had said it, that he was like, all right, yeah, there's not a quarterback controversy yeah. in Athens. Because at that point, I think he started to realize that Robert Griffin III might have meant it. Yeah. And then you get, you know, Mark coming out and writing his article, which I think that's what sparked the, you know, the article because the ESPN commentator was sitting there saying it. Yeah, I mean, as I said last week, I was like, is it really a UJ football season at this point without some type of QB controversy going on? But um, all in all, no, there is no QB controversy right now. I mean, all offseason, you're talking about people were saying it. Could JT Daniels win the Heisman? Is JT Daniels going to lead Georgia to a national championship? JT Daniels this, JT Daniels that. Everything was about JT Daniels. 
where is he going to take this offense? So JT Daniels is without a doubt the guy for Georgia moving forward. I think everybody knows that. Stetson Bennett is very well aware of that. He knows his role on the he team. He was not going into UAB trying to win the quarterback job. I mean, he knows his place on this team. He knows that he had his moment last year, provided us with some great, provided fans with some great moments last year. Just, I mean, he's a baller. That's what he does. I mean, that dude plays football really Nothing well. Nothing but respect for the kid. Yeah. At all. Yeah, nobody should have any hatred towards Stetson Bennett because he's just done tremendous things for this university, and he reps the G with some pride. So, I mean, everybody knows that JT Daniels is a starting quarterback, and whenever he is 100% healthy and ready to go, he is going under center without any questions asked. I mean, he's still taking reps now this week. Whether or not he plays on Saturday, nobody really knows. I think you probably see Stetson Bennett out there again under center which Georgia will be fine. That I mean, you, you can go against a team like South Carolina this year with Stetson Bennett, and you'll be just fine, I think. So if you can give JT Daniels any more rest, you might as well. If he's not feeling 100%, no need to play him. Get him ready for when you have teams like Arkansas coming into town versus when you're having South Carolina and Vanderbilt with your next two games. So no need to rush him back or re-aggravate his oblique injury. So I think you'll probably see Stetson Bennett again. But no, there is no QB controversy. It's no, not I think even the question. biggest thing to watch is at this point, I do think that QB two going into like a South Carolina game. I think whatever reason that made them decide, you know, after early week saying that Kirk Carson Beck was QB two, and whatever made them change their mind come Thursday to go with Stetson Bennett, whatever that was, I, I don't think has changed at this point either. So I think Stetson Bennett's the number two quarterback for now. That does not mean that Carson Beck could not or would not be the potential starting quarterback for 2022. Yeah. There's still going to be a position battle between him and Brock Vandergriff for QB1 next season. I, for one, still think that Carson Beck is going to have a very good opportunity to win that job. Personally, I would say that I, if I had to pick one right now, I think Carson Beck might have the edge because of two things. One, you've got Carson Beck with the extra experience, and he's going to get some more game time and stuff this year, which Brock Vandergriff really isn't going to have. So he's going to have the advantage of being in the system for two years with Todd Munkin, and he's going to have extra playing time in, in you know situations that he's not going to have in Brock Vandergriff. So that's where I think that the benefit is in his hands of it. So I'm not going to get into that full discussion necessarily right now, but that's the question that popped up. The quarterback controversy isn't for QB1 this season. It's QB1 next year. That's yeah. the stuff that really should be sparked up of it. And everyone talked about – you know, fans being really mad about Stetson Bennett starting. I, I, for one, wanted to see Carson Beck play this past Saturday because I felt like it was a good opportunity for him to play in a game like that to get real starting experience heading, you know, into the rest of the season. It, it's valuable time. Something changed. They decided not to do it. Whatever it is, we don't see what they see at practice. I don't know what's going on. And Stetson lit it up. So you can't argue with the decision that was yeah, made. Yeah, it may obviously made the right decision. You can't argue There's with the decision. There's a reason why we're not coaching a SEC football no, team. So. You, I can't argue with it. Personally, I wanted to see it because I want. I think it's beneficial to give a potential quarterback of the future the extra reps like that. Yeah. So, yeah, I would have loved to see it. But, no, I don't think fans should have been so hard on sets in the start with of it. And there was a lot of speculation of potential booing going on, you know, when he was announced in the pregame, you know, lineup. It came out later that some people, that other people that were there in the student section and stuff, they, they weren't booing Stetson Bennett. It, who's announced right after the starting quarterback? <laughs> Zeus. The starting running back, Zamir White. And every every time you see him touch the ball or he's announced, everyone yells, Zeus. Well, it's, I mean, it's funny. It I sounds mean, like boos. Sure. You, you can go back to the first. Don't spin that. You can go back to the first game that Zamir White ever got a carry in against Vanderbilt. And it was funny because he got his carry in. Even the announcers are like, are they booing? Like, are they booing it? And they're like, sounds no, like it, but it's not. It's them saying Zeus. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think anybody would boo Stetson Bennett. I mean, how could you after what all he's done for the university? But then also, staying on the topic of quarterbacks, some people are jumping the gun, of course, and saying that they're kind of done with Carson Bennett. Like, okay, well, that experiment's over. I mean, obviously, he didn't pan out. People are writing way, him off saying he's not going to have a chance. Way next year. too That's early to tell. I mean, you're talking about a kid. I mean, there's a lot of pressure for him. I mean, it's still it's UAB, so really not a whole lot of pressure on the game. But it's a lot of pressure for him. I mean, there's a lot of buzz going around him. You know, you were named the QB2 of the team. That's a big deal for you to be named the QB2 of the team, take over someone like Stetson Bennett to take over that position. So that he probably feels a lot of pressure on himself. Like, okay, now I have to go in this game and absolutely deliver. 
or I have to make a play, make sure that they know I deserve to have that spot, prove the, to the fans that I belong here. So there's a lot of pressure riding on him probably where he feels like he has to make the play and earn everybody's respect. So the more game reps he gets, which he may very well get some this Saturday if JT Daniels doesn't start, he could very well be thrown in there again with Stetson Bennett or uh, um, switch out with Stetson Bennett a couple of times. So the more reps he gets in games, the better off he's going to be. And of course, as more as he gets more experienced, he's going to be a lot more calmer in the pocket and he's going to be able to relax a little bit. I mean, that just comes with any player, like getting his first like big opportunity to really prove himself, you know, like someone like Brock Vandergriff, he's not feeling a lot of pressure because he knows he's probably just going in there to hand the ball off just like any third string quarterback does in a game like that. But for Beck, I mean, he probably felt like he had to prove something. So he probably put a lot of pressure on himself, some unwarranted pressure probably. Yeah. And I agree. And there's two things that I'll point out with it. When one going out of the game, everybody coming out saying that they, they think he's done, you know, in Georgia, they, I've heard people say stuff like that. Number one, one of the things that make people say it is the interception that he threw. When I go back and watch that play, there's two things about it. Yeah. You can still put some of it on him because he's the one who threw the ball, but the running back didn't turn his shoulder. didn't look back at the ball. And on that type of route that they were running into the flats, he's got to get his head around right away because it is a timing thing. The quarterback, if he is going to throw it to you in the flats, he has to throw it based on timing. He can't wait for you to turn your head around because at that point you'll either get destroyed when you touch the ball or they'll pick it anyways. So he has to throw it based on timing. I think it was Dejon Edwards. I want to say mm-hmm. not a very experienced running back for Georgia. Didn't turn around. And when he does turn around, the ball's in his face. Yeah. It's because he didn't get his head around fast enough on there. That is part of the reason that that ball was picked on there. And yeah, you can put some of it on Carson because he's the one that threw it and Maybe he should have looked somewhere else because the defender wasn't extremely far from there when he was throwing it, but it could have been a completed pass at the same time. So that's the first thing of it. And the second thing is, remember this, there's a reason that going into this season and going into the first couple games, he was named quarterback number two. That means that he was doing better than everybody else all offseason and everything to be that guy. Something changed and maybe they saw something that made them feel like he wasn't quite ready for a start. He's already been considered better than Stetson Bennett in the sense of being listed as the number two quarterback. And you saw what Stetson can do. There's something there with the kid because he had, you know, he ended up not starting and Stetson went off and his, you know, he did throw a pick in the game. Don't sit here and write the kid off and say, all right, well, I guess that means Brock Vandergriff has to be the starting quarterback next year. No, that's not it. That that doesn't mean that. It, it very well, you should really pay attention to the fact that he was listed the starting or the second quarterback on the depth chart in spite of Stetson Bennett still being there and in spite of, you know, Brock Vandergriff still being there as well as the backups. So he showed them that he was potentially the better quarterback at the time. I'm giving Brock the, you know, the way out on that because he was the freshman in there. He's learning the system. He's not going to be beating out Carson Beck right now. So maybe next year, you never know. I think the kid's a stud too. Quarterback situation next year is solid no matter who they go with. Yeah. Carson Beck is still Carson Beck. He's still got incredible arm talent. He's still extremely smart and athletic. Give the kid a little bit of time to develop, and I think he could potentially have a strong career in Athens, Georgia. Yeah, without a doubt. And, I mean, you can't you can't predict a guy's career off of what? He threw how many passes? Ten he threw passes. 10 passes. Was four if, for 10. If you're going to write a kid line. off uh, based on 10 passes. 88 and, yards. It's not bad in 10 passes. Based on 10 passes four completions. And, and him not – sprinting after a player who just got interception. And let me ask you this about that play. Who cares? He wasn't going to catch him. Well, and this is my point. Like, So Georgia's up 56-0 at that point. If JT Daniels is in the game up 56-0 and he throws an interception, are you going to are you going to get mad at him for not sprinting after a Do you yeah. really want him yeah. trying to make that play and really potentially hurting himself? Quarter, yeah, exactly my point. Are you no. getting mad at if that's JT Daniels? Nobody's even paying attention if that's JT Daniels. They're like, okay, threw an interception. That sucks. Nobody's saying anything about him not trying to run down the guy who just made the play. So just – I mean, of course, everybody's going to nitpick about that just because it's the backup quarterback. And, you know, all eyes are on him at that point. Like, let's see how he reacts. Let's see what he does. So look at it from that perspective. If it was JT Daniels, nobody says a thing about that at all. They say, okay, interception, let's move on, next play. That's it. So treat it like that. Just because it's Carson Beck doesn't mean we have to analyze it and really nitpick about anything like that. I mean, come on, it's 56 nothing. Yeah, it sucks to throw a pick. Yes, you probably should at least – Try and go tackle a guy and give maximum effort every single play. But at the end of the day, it really means nothing. Boils down to nothing. That doesn't put a reflection on anything about Carson Beck, I don't think. So I'll just leave it at that. 
And that's all my thoughts about Saturday. Absolutely. I agree. And I'll let that wrap it up on there. I'll save you from having to defend your arguments with Oregon tonight today, just well, for the get, sake of get time. Some more time. Just for the sake of time. Some more time. But I'm gonna call. I'm I working. might owe Mark Schleybach at, at an apology later on in the year, though. We'll talk next week. I'm gonna let that one hang out. We don't have time for that discussion today, but we'll talk about that next week again, anyways. <laughs> um, but as always, thank y'all for listening this long. Make sure you reach out to us on social media on Twitter at Dogs Daily P O D, and then on Facebook, go like that page as well at. Uh, it's facebook.com slash dogs daily POD as well. Make sure you're, if you're watching on YouTube, you subscribe, like the video, subscribe, all that good stuff. We need the help there. And also on the podcasting platforms, make sure you subscribe and you get notifications every time the new episodes are posted on there as well, available everywhere you can think of. So keep up with us there. we love, we love suggestions and everything like that. So if anything you want us to talk about, reach out to us. We love stuff like that. Um, so we'll, we'd be happy to take a, take a few minutes out of our episode to talk about whatever subject is important Absolutely. to you. Absolutely. So with all that being said, as always, keep it classy in the classic city. Go dogs, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Dogs Daily on Sports Illustrated. Take a second to subscribe, rate, review, and share with your friends and family. Feel free to reach out to the Dogs Daily crew on Twitter with any topics you'd like discussed. You can reach out to Jeremiah at Jeremiah underscore Stod 7, to Kyle at DK Fubderberg, and Jonathan at 22 underscore J-Man. Check back next week for a brand new episode. In the meantime, go dogs. Go dogs.